Hello, welcome to another lecture from Web Services. Um, today, we are going to talk about web service interfaces and uh, WISL, which is the language to describe web service interfaces. Um, but before we do that, let's recap a little bit the uh, W3C style web services stack. Uh, in the first lecture, we reviewed HTTP and we also talked about, um, well, SOAP a little bit in, uh, in the previous lecture. And uh, uh, we talked about XML. So uh, now we know that uh, web services exchange messages. Those messages can, or uh, the W3C style web services exchange messages using SOAP. We have already tried SOAP in uh, the tutorial. And we know that inside the SOAP message, we have an XML document, which is described by an XML schema. Uh, and uh, that is the application data being sent. We tried that uh, with the calculator web service, uh, where we actually created, uh, well, an XML message asking the web service to add one and two. And so uh, we received an XML response with uh, the number three. Uh, so that was SOAP uh, and XML, and uh, we used actually SOAP over HTTP. So we talked with the web service using SOAP over HTTP. We could have uh, communicated with uh, another web service using SOAP, using the same XML messages, but for instance, uh, using SMTP. So that would be sending the SOAP messages over uh, email. Uh, and, uh, and so on. So uh, we have seen that actually the transport protocol can be switched to something else than HTTP. And uh, why I am talking about this in such a detail now, because we are talking about uh, web service interfaces today. And of course, the binding to the actual transport protocol needs to be part of the web service interface description. So that will be part of the WSDL document, which will describe a web service interface. And uh, that is why uh, I am pointing that out. Um, so today, WSDL, part of the web service contract, the machine readable part, uh, the part that allows you to actually generate a web service client, um, which is something that uh, we will also see on one of the tutorials. Right, so two web services messaging using SOAP and today the interface description using WSDL. WSDL is again a W3C recommendation, but as with SOAP, where we had SOAP 1.1 and SOAP 1.2, where actually 1.1 is the more used one and 1.2 is the um, web standard one. With WSDL, the situation is similar. So there is WSDL 1.1, which is widely supported, widely used, but it is not a standard. It's just a note uh, formally. And then there is WSDL 2.0, which is a web standard, but it is not so widespread. Now combine this with the fact that we have also two major versions of SOAP. And you can see where this is going, right? Because each web service may implement a different combination of WSDL versions and SOAP versions and transport protocols and so on. So it really becomes uh, quite challenging not to get lost in that. But uh, we'll see how this is handled in, uh, in WSDL. So the situation we are in is that we have some implementation of a web service which we will not talk about. We will talk about the interface, uh, which is used by clients. Uh, when talking about the interface, we need to, however, describe everything there is about the web service. We need to describe the messages it uses to communicate, the transport protocol it uses to communicate, uh, the address where the web service lives, and uh, describe the operation that the web service offers, such as again, with the calculator web service uh, that it allows you to add, multiply, divide, and so on. Uh, and all this 
must be described in a machine readable form so that you can then point your client to the whistle file and it will generate all everything necessary to communicate with this web service for you. You have actually seen whistle in action in the last tutorial where we use SOAP UI uh, and we pointed SOAP UI first to the whistle of the calculator web service and then to the whistle generated by your Java web service. And in both cases, it resulted in SOAP UI um, understanding the file and generating all the requests uh, and the operations that you can uh, you could just just use. Um, so that is our goal. And uh, yeah, today we are going to go through a sample whistle file and explain all the parts uh, of whistle that uh, you need to know. And this is the overview, uh, again, what can be found in WSGL. Um, okay, so the first thing you will notice is that part of the um, image is green and part is blue. That has a good reason. Um, the green part is uh, called uh, abstract and the blue part is called concrete um, or specific. That's because, um, on the right hand side, we will describe the web service without actually binding it to any particular instance. And on the left hand side, in the blue side, we will take this abstract description of the web service and we will bind it to a specific instance running somewhere and uh, using some particular transport protocols. Uh, but starting from, from here, when you imagine what you need to describe if you want to actually communicate with a web service. So what do you need to know? And you all know this because you created a web service and you communicated with the calculator web service. So you already know what uh, it is that you actually need uh, to know in order to be able to communicate with the web service. Well, the first thing you need to know is how the XML data should be structured. So this can be described, for instance, by an XML schema saying that uh, you have an um, add element with two child elements in A and B containing the two operands to the add uh, operation, for instance. So uh, those can be, uh, and so this includes the uh, namespaces and the element names and their types and so on. So that is uh, the types section in WSDL. So there will be a list of uh, XML types defined and XML elements defined, usually using XML schema. It is not the only option, but it is the usual one. Right, so with types, we know uh, how the XML data should be structured, right? But uh, we also need to know uh, what messages are actually to be sent and received uh, by the web service or by the client. So then we'll have a set of messages um, using the types defined in the types section. And those messages will really represent the messages being sent and received uh, by a client. And those messages can be input and output messages. Of course, that's the message that you send and the message that you receive. And uh, the messages can be fault messages where something goes wrong either on the application level or on the SOAP level. Um, and uh, the set of messages, inputs, outputs, and faults, is grouped into operations such as add, multiply, divide, where the messages are the, the add request and the response, for instance. Right. So like this, we can have, again, with the calculator web service, four operations, let's say. And uh, those operations actually together form a uh, port type, something called a port type, which represents the entire web service, uh, web service with the operations, with the messages, with the types. So with this abstract description, we already know how to communicate with the web service exactly. Um, actually, exactly from the application data point of view. So we know how the XML should look like. We know how the messages sh sh uh, should look like. And we know the operations that the web service offers. What we do not know is using which transport protocol to communicate with the web service 
at which URL the web service actually lives. And um, that is uh, the role of, uh, of the blue part here. The blue part uh, binds the abstract description to an actual instance. So uh, the, the green part is like a blueprint, an interface that you can instantiate and at, at many sites, but each site needs to be um, described by a specific binding. And that's the blue part. So um, here we bind the messages to the actual transport protocol. So we say, okay, the, the add request message should be sent using SOAP, using HTTP, um, and so on for, e for each message. This is grouped into an operation binding and the binding of a specific port type. Uh, so uh, that's the entire web service bound to uh, particular transport protocols and, uh, and definitions. Um, then we have a port, which basically takes the binding and assigns a URL, URL to it, saying you can communicate with the web service like this on that URL. And then we have something called a service, which can consist of many ports. So you can have many ports together, they form a service. So this is everything that we now need to describe using WSDL. And uh, again, it is split into the abstract and the concrete part. And we'll start describing the abstract part now. So without any particular instantiation, this is what we need to describe any web service. The types using XML schema or any other actually schema language, the messages using those types, the operations grouping the messages and the port types grouping the operations. So the port type again is the calculator web service. The operations is add, divide, multiply. The messages is, uh, or the messages are, um, add request, add response, or maybe some fault. And the type is the XML element definition representing the operands to the add uh, operation, for instance. And this is how uh, the actual WSDL file will look like. Uh, we are starting with WSDL 1.1, which is the more widespread one. It is, of course, an XML document again, and it has the following structure. Um, of course, the prologue, and then the root element is called definitions in WSDL 1.1. It, of course, again, belongs or is defined in a particular namespace. So again, working with namespaces is even more important with WSDL, as you will see, than it was in SOAP, and it was already pretty important in SOAP. So really, when you're working with WSDL, um, take care about the, the namespaces, really important. Uh, right, and let's start from the beginning. So the first sub element of definitions is documentation. There you can have any text you want, that's uh, up to you. So we won't have to go through that. Uh, just an example of how such a root element actually typically looks like is something like this. It is really packed with namespace definitions. That's because uh, the uh, WSDL description of the web service interface uh, is really like extensible and each extension or specific binding uses its own namespace. So typically in such a WSDL document, you will find many uh, XML namespaces. And again, typically they will be uh, defined in, uh, on the root element. Another important part here is the target namespace. We talked already about target namespace when we talked about XML schema, where the XML schema, when it uses target namespace, it basically means that all the complex types and elements and so on that you name in that schema actually belong to this namespace. So they are named using a qualified name uh, where this is the namespace and then the name is the local name within that namespace. With WSDL, it works in the exactly same way. Uh, a WSDL file has a target namespace and everything that you create within that WSDL document, messages, bindings, post types, and so on, everything will be named and it will be named within this particular namespace that you target. 
with the visible uh, file. So then when you actually reference those parts, you need to reference them with uh, the namespace uh, so that it is clear which element uh, you mean. Another interesting uh, part here is that because typically within the whistle file, you reference various parts a lot. For instance, you have operations which consist of messages. You need to define the messages first, and then within those operations, you reference those messages. You need to reference them with the qualified name because they are defined within the whistle file with the target namespace. But the target namespace attribute itself actually does not define any particular namespace. It just says everything that is created within that whistle file falls into that namespace. But if you want to refer to that namespace, you need to define the namespace prefix for that. A convention for that is that you define a namespace called NS or TNS as target namespace. And notice that this namespace is the same as the target namespace. That's because when you then reference to the things created within the whistle file, you use the NS prefix for that. Um, and you need to define that because the, the target namespace itself does not define any prefix for you. So you need to do it. And that is why typically there is one of the namespaces uh, for, for the target namespace. Um, and again, the convention is either NS or TNS. It is of course up to you, but uh, TNS is really uh, used quite a lot as a target namespace. Right, so that was the root of the whistle file. Let's move on um, to the types. So the types contain uh, definition, definitions of elements and complex types you can use to actually represent messages or use in, uh, in messages. So for instance, here we have within whistle types, we have an XML schema and the XML schema uh, creates a hello world and hello world response elements and defines them as the XML schema allows you to do. Whistle is quite universal. So it allows you to use other uh, XML schema messages, uh, XML schema languages in the types elements, such as relaxng, schematron, and so on. However, typically in implementations of the web services stack, only XML schema is supported typically, but Whistle allows you to use any schema language. Also, uh, non-XML type, uh, type system can be used, but again, Whistle allows you to do this, but the specific implementations of Whistle then have a subset of those capabilities that they actually implement. And typically they limit their, uh, themselves to XML schema here. So that's the types part. You define all the elements and complex types that you will need um, in those messages. Next come the messages themselves. So there will be a list of messages in the whistle file defining all the messages that can be sent or received by a web service. Um, and so the definition looks like this. It's a message. It has a name. Again, notice that when you name something, you do not use any prefix, but it will. And this is the local name that will be combined with the target namespace. So this is actually a definition of a mess message called this within the target namespace of the WSDL file. And uh, here we have two messages, request and response to some hello world uh, service. So that's it, we have two messages and the messages in WSDL 1.1, they have parts. Um, Right, again, you can name those parts and those parts actually link to the actual elements or complex types defined in the types section. So now we are saying we have a hello world request, which has one part and that one part is the NS hello world um, element, which uh, corresponds to this one defined in the XML schema in the types section. So like this, we have the definition of all the messages exchanged with the web service, and we can continue uh, and we can define the port type, which is like the, the uh, overall abstract web service. 
It consists of the operations that the web service actually implements or should implement when implemented uh, or instantiated. So here we have a hello world port type and it consists of two operations, say hello and say goodbye. Each operation then consists of a sequence or a set of messages. So for instance, the, um, the hello world operation here, actually that could be say hello, but uh, yeah, so the operation here has an input message and an output message. So if you want to call this operation, you need to send this message to the web service and you will receive a message corresponding to the XML schema defining this uh, as a response. Now you can of course also define the fault messages here, but we skip that for now. Based on uh, the order of those messages in uh, that operation and their number, you are actually also defining message exchange patterns. So we already talked about message exchange patterns in context of SOAP, uh, but this is uh, in the context of WSGL. So here we actually say that the operation adheres to some particular message exchange pattern. Now, uh, there are four basic message exchange patterns in WSGL 1.1. If you only define an input message, then of course, this is a one-way uh, operation. You send something to the web service and you don't receive anything in response. Um, the, the opposite of that is the notification message exchange pattern when, where you just um, receive as a client, receive messages from the web service, but you do not send any to the web service. So that's a notification web, uh, type uh, web service. And then you have request response. That's the usual one. So you send a message and you receive a message. And there is also an uh, opposite of that. And that's called solicit response where you actually as a client wait until you receive a message from the web service and then you um, respond to the web service. So that's the other way around from request response. And those are the four basic message exchange patterns. Again, defined by the order of the inputs and outputs within uh, the operation. Now, order of XML elements within an element is important and it is defined. So uh, you can rely on it. And uh, here it defines the message exchange patterns. So with a definition like this, you know which operations the web service offers, which messages in which order should be sent to communicate with the web service. And you know what to put in those messages because you have the XML schema definitions of the elements within that message. So you have basically everything. And now you need to instantiate that web service somewhere, bind it to the concrete protocols and uh, start communicating with it. So for that, you need the concrete uh, description, uh, which consists of binding support and service. Bindings bind operations to and, and messages to specific transport protocol such as SOAP, but that's not the only option. Um, we will see at the end of this lecture, an example of a binding directly um, to HTTP without SOAP. But again, a typical binding is to SOAP over HTTP. So like this, we bind all the operations and then we use this, this binding and um, connect it to a specific URL where the web service actually lives. And that's the, that's the port. And we can group multiple ports to a service. So we continue with uh, the structure of the WISG document. We already have the types, the messages and the port type. And now we continue with bindings. So again, bindings basically specify which transport protocols are used to um, send and receive the messages in the operations defined in the abstract part of uh, the description. So from the point of WSGL itself, the binding is really simple. It is just a binding element named somehow pointing to a port type saying, I am now specifying the binding for that port type. And from the WSGL point of view, that, that is it because uh, what is inside the binding element is actually protocol specific. 
depends on whether you use HTTP or whether you, you use SMTP or whether you, whether you use SOAP over HTTP and so on. Um, and every option like this of the binding has its own set of configuration parameters. So that's why from the point of view of WSGL, uh, basically the binding is, uh, is simple like this. It needs to bind all the operations, that's true. So you will find an operation element for each operation in the post type and all the messages. So you will have typically inputs, outputs, and faults. And each element will contain protocol-specific information. An example of attending with a protocol-specific information is, uh, is like this. So we have the whistle binding named somehow uh, binding this particular port type. It's uh, some kind of demo web service. We can see the operation here, and we can see the input and output here. That's the whistle part of, of the binding. The elements and attributes um, with the whistle SOAP namespace are the protocol specific information. Because here we are actually binding to SOAP over HTTP. So all those configurations here that you can see in the whistle SOAP uh, namespace are specific to this particular binding. SOAP over HTTP. So um, here we say um, basically that we use SOAP over HTTP. Uh, we could use SOAP over SMTP or something else. Um, so here we use SOAP over HTTP. And uh, then we say that the operation Hello World does not need any SOAP action. Uh, IRI, we already know SOAP action, right? That's the IRI that you can use on the level of the HTTP protocol to indicate uh, what the operation is about. Uh, so that the um, network devices working just on the HTTP level can already work with the information that would otherwise be hidden within the SOAP message. So you can say, okay, this operation corresponds to a particular SOAP action. Uh, and then with the inputs and outputs, uh, because we are talking about SOAP, and SOAP is an XML element envelope with headers and, uh, and a body. We say that the hello world request message um, should be used as a body of the SOAP message. We could also say that, that um, this, this, this message path actually, which represents the XML element, should be sent in a SOAP header. That would also be, um, defined here. But in this example, both the request and response data is uh, sent in whistle body, uh, in SOAP body, sorry. So like this, it is now clear how to send the messages um, to a web service instance. What is not clear is where that instance lives. Uh, so again, yeah, messages using uh, SOAP, SOAP 1.1 over HTTP. Uh, this is the SOAP action and uh, the, the data will be sent as SOAP body. Right, so this brings us to the last uh, element in the WSGL file, that's the services uh, or service element, which describes the individual ports. And the ports basically tell you where to send the messages uh, described in bindings. So a port binds a binding to a location which is a URL, which you can use to communicate with the web service. So like this, the description of the web service is complete because you know where the web service lives. Uh, you know the particular message transport protocols and you know all the um, XML schema types and uh, elements and uh, the messages and the operations. So like this, based on this information, you are able to actually generate a client or you just know how to communicate with that web service. So this actually finishes the overview of uh, uh, Whistle 1.1. So again, the types, uh, the XML types, the messages, the operations grouping, the messages and the port types grouping the operations, then binding of those to particular message transfer, uh, transfer protocols and to a specific location using port. Now, back to the number of versions of SOAP and WSGL. Um, 
there are actually specifications for all the combinations of versions. So each, uh, each line here, each bullet is a separate specification. So there is a specification for WSGL 1.1, SOAP 1.1 over HTTP binding. That is basically what we have seen in the example. What we'll see now is WSGL 1.1, SOAP 1.2 over HTTP. Uh, as um, uh, because we are talked a little bit more about how the binding looks like. And as you can see, there are specifications for so both versions over Java messaging service. So that's another transport protocol. And there is a specification for the email conversation with a web service. And then we also see how WSGL 2.0 handles the so bindings. Uh, right, so now we'll switch for a little bit to SOAP 1.2 and uh, we'll go deeper a little bit into the, into the binding. So the binding type is basically given by the namespace URI you use for the protocol specific information elements. So here we'll use um, the SOAP 1.2 um, namespace and therefore it is clear that we are binding the uh, the web service to SOAP 1.2. Um, the binding itself will look the same. It will just use another namespace. So again, here we are talking about SOAP 1.2 over HTTP. Uh, now notice that there is a style attribute here set to document. There are actually two main styles of, uh, of binding. Um, one style is RPC oriented. Um, so Basically, what we have seen when you generated your Java web service and uh, its WSDL, that was an RPC-oriented WSDL or web service because you had your method implemented in Java and you exposed it as a web service so that it can be called from another code or another software as a method. So it is a typical RPC remote procedure call. Um, in that case, uh, the so body contains one element um, and a set of arguments corresponding to the arguments of the method. And uh, the return message um, then uh, contains uh, the, the element representing the returned value from that method. So that's the RPC oriented message, uh, message style. And then there is a document oriented uh, operation or message style. Uh, which basically means that you have the parts which are described by XML schema and so on. And it is then up to the application to parse those documents. The RPC uh, style typically is used where uh, web services are generated from code. Um, and uh, this is used for, for other web services. Right, so that's the style in, in the operation binding. And then here we can specify the uh, SOAP action and whether or not the SOAP action um, header is actually required to call a particular operation. Um, then we specify that, for instance, the input message should be again in, in SOAP body. Um, it references uh, the parts that form uh, the actual message. And uh, then there is an attribute use, which basically says whether um, the XML element is being sent as it is described by the XML schema or whether it is actually encoded somehow, which it can be. Um, yeah, and this is how it looks like when we would say that the input data is actually being sent in a SOAP header. So it looks similar, but here we use the header element. So like this, the data is sent in SOAP body like this, it is sent in SOAP header. Uh, and uh, then there is of course the, uh, the element uh, defining the URL where you can so send the um, SOAP 1.2 messages. And again, from uh, the SOAP 1.2 namespace. So that's it. Now we have seen, uh, we have seen how a, another binding looks like. It contains very similar uh, attributes or elements uh, that you can use to configure the binding. And uh, all the bindings will contain similar, similar um, configuration. Now, I talked about two versions of WSDL. 
So now, up to now, we talked about WSDL 1.1, uh, uh, and we need to take a look at WSDL 2.0 as well, uh, so that uh, we are able to understand it. And there are a few changes. Some of them are uh, little ones because they are just renaming of uh, elements. So for instance, what was called a port in WSDL 1.1, which is the connection of a binding to a specific URL, in WSDL 2.0, it is uh, called an endpoint. Uh, the root element is no longer definitions, it is description. And uh, the post type is no longer called a post type, but it is called an interface, which makes more sense because it is actually an interface. And one more substantial change is that there are no uh, messages in WSDL 2.0, they are defined within that interface. So um, an example of how an interface definition looks like in WSDL 2.0. So again, this was called a port type before. Now it's an interface and it combines the port type and messages from WSDL 1.1. So here we have an interface with an operation, check service status, uh, and we can see uh, the message exchange pattern uh, defined explicitly. So it is no longer dependent on uh, the order of messages within a post type. So here, that's the in out message exchange pattern. So that's the typical request response. Um, then we have a style. This this IRI actually or URI um, is the same as the uh, document style before. So this says um, that the elements within the message are described by XML schema. I'm not sure why uh, the URI saying this is so cryptic, while it is called an IRI style. It doesn't make much sense, but this IRI simply means that uh, the contents of the messages is described by XML schema. And then we, we can see the definitions of the messages, input, output, and uh, out fault. We can also have in fault. Um, each message has a label saying which role it plays in the message exchange pattern. Because here we have the in out message exchange pattern. It actually defines, it has its own specification. And, and it defines that um, there are two roles in and out. So then we say that the input message plays the in uh, role and the output message plays the out role. And we point those messages to the element definitions in the types section. So like this. We define the entire interface with the messages and the message exchange pattern. Um, you can also, uh, but we'll get to that uh, later. Right, uh, now that uh, are the changes uh, on the level of WSDL itself. Uh, let's take a quick look at uh, WSDL 2.0 SOAP binding. Fortunately, with WSDL 2.0, there is just one SOAP binding independent of the SOAP version. So the SOAP version to be used is actually just a parameter in, in this uh, version attribute. There are no, uh, there aren't, aren't two, specific, uh, two separate specifications for binding WSDL 2.0 to SOAP 1.1 and 1.2. It is just a one, uh, just a one binding. Uh, we need to specify the message transport protocol used by SOAP. So in this case, again, it is HTTP. And then we bind the operations to um, SOAP message exchange patterns and, uh, and so on. We also indicate that this message may trigger a fault, but uh, yeah. Finally, the, uh, the final difference in WSDL 2.0 is the renaming of port to endpoint. So this is a service with an endpoint binding the, uh, the binding to a particular URL by the uh, web service lives. So like this, you know that there is a web service implementing some interface uh, described by WSDL 2.0. Now within WSDL 2.0, we have actually many exchange patterns predefined. So uh, in WSDL 1.1, we had the basic four. In 2.0, in, in the core specification, there is in only, in out, and robust in only. Robust means that it can trigger a fault. 
if it's not robust, then it uh, doesn't trigger a fault. And then there is another specification extending the number of message exchange patterns uh, with uh, the ones you can see here. So that is just so that you are not surprised if you see uh, some of those message exchange patterns used with Visible 2.0. And this actually brings us, yeah, this brings us to the end of today's lecture. It will be a short, uh, it's a short one because uh, I think it's maybe quite a lot of in information to process. And we also need to uh, get our hands on actual wisdom files uh, in the tutorial before we continue. So uh, this will be it for today. One last example, and it's the one I promised. Uh, this is a whistle binding without any uh, SOAP um, as message um, transfer protocol. This is a binding of a web service directly to HTTP. So here we have a binding, of course. Uh, we point to the interface that is being bound and we say, okay, this binding is of the direct HTTP type, no SOAP here. And therefore we need to bind the operations to HTTP, not SOAP. And therefore we say, okay, this, um, this operation here is implemented as a get method uh, at this location. This is a relative URL. Um, and it may trigger a fault. And if that fault happens, it is represented by the fault and HTTP code. So here, the actual message in the XML is sent directly using HTTP and it is, it is not um, enveloped in a SOAP message. Uh, again, not many WISL implementations actually support this. Um, so, um, if you want to use something like that, uh, whistle without soap, um, you may have a hard time actually finding an implementation doing so. That's because the typical use case for uh, W3C style web services is whistle and, uh, well, the typical one is whistle 1.1 and uh, one of the soap versions. Uh, with 2.0 is also typically implemented. Um, but uh, not with all the binding uh, binding types. So that's it for today. Any questions? I think it's pretty straightforward, but it's a lot of information to take in. Um, so it will require you to actually write a whistle document by hand to understand what exactly is going on. And you will do that on the tutorial tomorrow. <laughs>